Hello, and welcome to our lecture today on charisma and religious social functions. So this, this lecture has three parts. One, we're going to talk about a specific charismatic religious figure. Then we're going to talk about the nature of charisma and how charisma gets integrated into established religions or how charisma is established in religions, how it is institutionalized. And finally, we're going to talk about types of religious institutions, uh, namely uh, churches, sects, and mysticism. So first off, what is a guru? So we hear this word a lot. You say this guy, oh, guys, he's like the information tech guru. He's like the golf guru. Well, guru is a Sanskrit word that just means heavy as in someone who is heavy with good qualities. Now, Indians in general have a notion of anyone who is a great teacher that you sort of submit to is your guru, and they'll have different like levels of guru. So you'll have your engineering guru, or your drumming guru, and your dance guru. But then you also have sort of like a spiritual guru. Now, the spiritual guru is the one who you devote yourself to, and um, some will say they will even treat their guru as if they are God. And that guru is sort of like your main absolute spiritual teacher. So these gurus, uh, these spiritual gurus, are often the heads of organizations. So some gurus are considered to be so great that they're called avatars. Now the word avatar comes from Sanskrit. We've had that before. It means one who has crossed over. So an in or crossed downward, who has come to earth. God come to earth. So I've got some pictures here. We have Guru Nanak who is the founder of Sikhism, and for my money is actually kind of one of the coolest gurus in the Indian tradition. And then we have contemporary gurus of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi there on the left, and this guy Sadhguru, who uh, gives a whole lot of Indian internet videos and has some troubling thoughts if you dig deep enough. Though I know I was working in a, a high school a little while back and a guy turned to me, another teacher and said, hey, have you heard of this Sadhguru? I'm like, yeah, he is a Sadhguru. That's Sadhguru means like the highest of all the gurus. Uh, all right, so when I'm using the term guru today, I'm going to mean just sort of like a spiritual teacher who's the head of a organization, of a religious organization. That's the fountainhead of knowledge and is also the leader of a spiritual organization. So we've got a specific guru that Kripal started the chapter with uh, as a character name, his English name would be Franklin Jones, but he's gone by a lot of names such as Bubba Free John, John Adi, Adi Da. He's had about you know, like 20 names, which is interesting to think about. Why do gurus change their names? Is it because they're trying to uh, obfuscate so that nobody knows who they actually are? Is it because they're on the run from the law? Or is it because they're trying to show us to not be so attached to things like names? So Franklin Jones was an American guru. He died in 2008. Uh, he had some connections to various established religious groups, namely Scientology at one point and an organization called Siddha Yoga, one of which I've been involved with myself at some point in my life. It's up for you to decide. Anyway, so he was active in the United States. He's born in New York. Uh, he, had a, he had a lot of um, sort of religious places that were set up in California and in Hawaii, and his main church ended up being in Fiji. Eventually, throughout the course of his guruship and his life, he began to be considered or consider himself an incarnation, an avatar of God. He was a figure of grace, and he said that being devoted to him in his physical realized state could bring about salvation. So when I talk about gurus, I'm actually talking about new religious movements, which was shortened to NRM. So a lot of people, when they talk about new religious movements, really will use the word cult. Now that comes from the Latin word to worship. What we're really talking about when people talk about cults are charismatic new religious movements or new religious movements that have charismatic leaders at their heads. Um, new religious movements are communities that are religious but they have modern origins and they are either on the fringe of an established religion or they're establishing their own religion or their own tradition. So some that we hear about an awful lot, we have Osho Rajneesh here on the left. Uh, he was immortalized in the Netflix documentary, Wild Wild Country, which I thoroughly recommend you watch. Osh is interesting. Um, when he was Rajneesh in India, he was, a fan, he was like a, a philosophy professor. And then he found a way to kind of apply all of his knowledge of Indian philosophy and Western philosophy into this like kind of wild, um, this wild kind of guru movement that was all about sort of uh, self-realization and free sexuality and whatnot. 
In the center there, we have the great L. Ron Hubbard, the Scientologist, the founder of Scientology, who was a sci-fi writer uh, who figured out a way to put it all into practice. Interestingly, he was uh, he, he was involved with an early organization in Los Angeles that became what's called the Ordo Templi Orientis. So these are what are called Thalamites. It's an organization started by Aleister Crowley. And these early people in this organization, while Crowley was still alive, said that L. Ron Hubbard would be, uh, or was quite possibly the most powerful natural magician that they'd ever met. Well, he took off with uh, another founder's boat and started his own religion of Scientology and uh, never really had much to do with those other Aleister Crowley-esque groups again. Then you have David Koresh on the right, who um, in the Branch Davidians, he had a sort of interesting interpretation of, of Christianity, specifically the Book of Daniel, and he would interpret um, Christianity and himself as sort of a messianic movement. Let me go back for a second. David Crash was in Waco, Texas. He had a religious organization with lots of Christians in it. He began to see himself as an, a coming Christ-like figure or as the world about to ending, to, to be ended. And he started stockpiling weapons and the FBI raided the place and set it on fire and a lot of people died and it's horrible. Now, the majority of new religious movements um, all in all, are not violent. The majority of them come out of Christian groups. Uh, in a way, you could say that David Koresh's group is definitely Christian. You could say that uh, L. Ron Hubbard was definitely just kind of coming out of a general American milieu that was more Protestant than one would admit. So um, we hear about, about we hear a lot about Jonestown, uh, and we hear a lot about Waco, but most of these just groups are non-criminal, and they do not end in mass suicides. <laughs> Okay, so who's this Franklin Jones again? So we have Franklin Jones. So here we're going to talk about the earlier stage of his sort of guruship, in which he went by the name Bubba Free John. Uh, it, as a young man, he'd always been interested in religion, and he attended college and did a master's degree in English. Uh, but he was pulled toward a spiritually engaged life, and he was also pulled toward taking quite a bit of psychedelics. This was the 60s. That's what happens. Uh, anyway, so initially he met a teacher who went by the name of Rudrananda. He was a man named Albert Rudolph, who was a wealthy art dealer. And this wealthy art dealer was following a charismatic guru from India named Swami Muktananda. Muktananda means um, the, he who is delighted in liberation or in being liberated. Muktananda started a religious group called Siddha Yoga that exists today and can be found in the United States and in India. So Muktananda was this Indian character who wandered around India looking for realization and he found it when he met his own guru, Nityananda. You don't need to remember that. So Muktananda sets himself up and he starts visiting with people and teaching a type of Tantra that is very much about all the world is Shiva and his consciousness encountering itself. And Muktananda and Baba Frijan, they got along well. They saw eye to eye on a lot of stuff. Eventually, uh, Franklin Jones left his spiritual pursuit of Swami Muktananda, trying to understand this sort of tantra, tantric realization. And he got involved with Scientology for a year. Go figure, everybody was doing it. Um, he, because he was a Scientologist, he severed all his ties with his prior teacher, namely this Albert Rudolph. Uh, after a year in Scientology, he got out and he decided he wanted to get back to doing the Indian thing. He reconnected with Rudrananda. He went back to India and met with Muktananda. But at this point, Muktananda and him weren't getting along terribly well. So Bubba Free John set out on his own. Now, the interesting thing I find about um, Bubba Free John is that his teachings are remarkably consistent. And he wrote quite a bit. That's, there's stuff that he wrote. There's transcriptions of his lectures. They're all actually quite good. He's a very lively writer. He argues that there's nothing but God and all the world is the play of consciousness. And all of that play of consciousness is identical God to God. The key is to realize that you are God and to let that experience expand out of any contracted egoic notion of yourself so you realize that you are all of existence. He calls this experience of consciousness being all one thing as the bright. So what's consistent here is this sounds a lot like what Muktananda was teaching. It's a lot like what Abhinavagupta, the guy who wrote down all those medieval tantric rituals, was teaching as well. So he's in fact an American who's operating as an Asian guru or in the way of an Asian guru. 
The next phase in Muktananda, or in um, Bubba Free John's life, he calls the garbage in the goddess stage. This is the stage of crazy wisdom. Now, when I say crazy wisdom, that means gurus who would act wild to sort of challenge people's understandings of the world. Now, this does exist in India. There are uh, religious gurus called Abhadutas who are thought to be beyond all conventional morality. They often wander around naked. Um, they're, they're, they don't observe any purity laws. The idea is they are they have transcended everything that we consider of as being normal and are beyond all that we see as normal. So um, Baba Frijan, Baba Frijan, was in fact kind of working out this Avaduta style of living, which was the style of Muktananda's guru, Nityananda. We are going to return to Muktananda and Nityananda um, in the in coming weeks. All right, so in this time, he, through the 70s and into the 80s, he would write extensively, and he also gave a lot of public lectures and what they called satsang lectures. Satsang means the gathering of the faithful or gathering in truth. It would, he, would, he would hang out and he would give lectures and he would invite people to be with him and partake in his sort of liberated state of consciousness. Um, like I said, satsang means the gathering of the good and the gathering in truth. He extended satsang, as I said, to being in and oriented toward his own state of realization. So he's a very much a charismatic figure. There's something about this guy. People want to be around him. People think what he says is powerful. And even more so, when people go and do these satsangs and gather with him, some of them would go into trance. And it was thought that he could put people into trance. Now, let's take a step back. Shaktipat, the descent of Shakti, the goddess of power, uh, or the power goddess. Now, Muktananda was known for being able to bring people into his presence and with a gaze, with a touch, could cause the divine presence of the Shakti to descend and go into people and have like the Kundalini's fully awakened, and they go batty. And I can tell you that idea of being able to do the Shaktipat, to awaken the shakti that's sleeping, sort of like to uncoil the kundalini, bang, like that, just by a guru's touch, just by a guru's gaze. Um, that's continued in Siddha Yoga to this day where they have a contemporary guru. And, and I've been to their ashram in India a bunch of times, and you can still feel it there. There's something about a shakti pot guru. The idea that this guru, by their mere, by a mere word, by telling you a mantra, just by looking, or you touching them, somehow you all awaken but it's temporary. Now they would, the Shaktipat gurus will say, oh, don't worry, that's the process has started. It's all gonna happen. Don't worry about it too hard. I'm never fond of that notion of, it'll just work itself out. So it'll just work it out. It will just work itself out on the own in the religious context. So supposedly, um, Maybe Muktananda gave, uh, gave Baba Frijan this ability. Maybe he didn't. Maybe Baba Frijan just had it. But he could look at people, he could touch people, and they would awaken. He was also known, um, he was also known to be unconventional. He would change his appearance and his name often. Um, sometimes he would even go naked like an Avaduta. He would, um, he would encourage drug and alcohol use and polygamy and polyamory, it was the 70s. And he would enable orgies and various public sex practices during this period, not so much later in his life. Toward the end of every satsang, he would have what's called darshan. Darshan means when you look at the God and the God looks at you. Usually it's when you go into a Hindu temple and you stand before the deity, before the image. Now in darshan with a human, you're standing before the human and you're looking at one another. And it's thought that you can have a transcendent experience in that way. Um, this period he called the garbage and the goddess because he, there were so many amazing experiences um, but he told people to not get attached to them because they wouldn't get, they wouldn't endow liberation. He said that he could just jam cosmic consciousness into people for a hundred years and they still wouldn't get enlightened. They had to go beyond these sort of spontaneous experiences. My point for bringing this up is we have charismatic figures to this day that cause all sorts of crazy stuff to happen that um, get that people are drawn to. So it's not that far off to see these figures as being charismatic uh, religious folks like a Jesus Christ. Um, or like, you know, or, well, there's innumerable Hindu gurus, so we'll just leave it at that. Anyway, so, uh, Bum Free John had sort of a disgust by the fact that he didn't become more popular 
because uh, he thought he was going to become this grand religious teacher, and he started to be facing a lot of public criticism for some of his actions and the actions of people in his community. So he had this anxious breakdown, and he came out with a changed vision of himself. Now, he argued that every time he would have one of these breakdowns, would be connected to some sort of spiritual breakthrough. You would say that these anxiety attacks would actually catalyze spiritual breakthroughs. So at this point, he considered himself to be, instead of just a mere teacher, but to be an avatar whose presence on the earth was to bring grace and to, by his presence, liberate people through them being around him. Now, he stopped giving as much public engagement and he would still do darshan, but he would remain silent. And you can watch videos from this time and it's just him very actively sitting and people coming up to him and him looking at them and this with his like kind of piercing eyes. It's a bit intense. And if you look to the right, I see a very Alex Gray inspired piece. You've seen some pieces of art um, by this artist as well. You'll see the horse riding up his spine. His original organization was called the Dawn Horse. All right, so this group was pretty established by this period. They called themselves Adi Dam or the place of Adi. Oh yeah, he changed his name to Adi Da. Uh, da means the giver and Adi, the, the most primordial, the great, the first thing. So the giver of the greatest experience, maybe you could say, or the foremost experience. So Adi Dam is the place of Adi, and uh, the community members would call themselves Gurubais, which just mean like brothers of the gurus, the devotees. I had a friend when I was living in India who had grown up in one of these ashrams, actually oversaw the library and just told me wonderful stories about hanging out with Adida throughout his um, throughout his youth. I think he in fact moved to Fiji and was like in the school there. He like did his high school in Fiji at the Adida school. He, he tells lovely stories about the time there. Anyway, so the church was established in Fiji, but there are also sanctuaries in North America and Hawaii. Now, um, when Adida died, he said that there would not be another religious leader for this group. He also said that nobody should be put in charge of this thing. So the question is, how is it going to continue? How does the charisma carry on? Well, it carries on through sacred architecture because he has a number of, uh, he established a number of, of places that are considered holy, that are supposed to be the instantiation of his power. It's also through his teachings and his texts. So he published many, 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 many books. So those are still out there. They're still excellent. Um, he also, uh, there's lots of videos of him on YouTube. So his lecture life lives on as well on the internet, as in so many things they do. Uh, yes, and then there's also through the tales and writings of his devotees writing about him and their experiences of him. <clears throat> he died in 2008. So when we talk about, about people founding religions, it's not always in the past. New religions are being founded today, such as this one by Adi Da. And the miracles of Christ and the Buddha, when you read about them, are still happening by religious folks to this day. I read often in Hindi sources about the powers of yogis that overlap with the powers of Christ. Even my magic text, I have, I have one that gives you the ability to walk over water, multiply food, and bring people back from the dead. So it lets you know maybe these uh, spiritual miraculous events aren't so stuck in the past as we might think. After all, there are miracles that are still documented by uh, Catholic saints to this day. Anyway, so um, Adi Das shows how an Indian style guru who is a Westerner and speaking English using mostly Western terminology was able to independently create his own religious group based on his own charisma and based on borrowing a lot from a couple of very specific Indian teachers. So um, like I said, why, why this guy? Why are we looking at him? Religious founders are not just in the past. The miracles of Christ and the Buddha still occur. He's an Indian style Western guru and he's charismatic. Well. What do I mean by charisma? What is the charismatic? Well, we also have to ask, what is religion, as we're always doing? Is it a specific, is it a specific, is it a specific historical event and a founder, or is it about persisting institutions? Today, I'm going to talk about the latter. So our chapter opens with a quote by Karl Marx that says, it is society that thinks in me. In this sense, all the social contacts and institutions that we're raised in that are surrounding us are internalized within us. So we are a product of our society. So the question, and, and we assume that that's universally true. The American way of life is the greatest way of life. Everyone should aspire to it. But why would a French person think that? Why would an Indian person think that? Why would a Zambian person think that? And so what I wanted to 
put upon you is to say that how much are your individual thoughts shaped by those social institutions? As Marx says, it is society that thinks in me. Marx was looking into himself and said, every time I'm thinking of this, it's a product of the capitalist world that I've seen rising and the social institutions around me in Germany and in England. So the question is always, <clears throat> Do I think or does society think me? Am I just having society's thoughts because I'm a perfect replicant of society? Are my thoughts my own or is it just society thinking me? Or to take a more mystical statement by Leonard Cohen, in fact, is this life I'm living or is it life living me? Sounds a little bit more mystical. But it is interesting to, to interrogate our own thoughts and really ask, well, which ones of these are my own? Are any of them really my own? Do I have any actual own original thoughts that are not connected in some way to the society I'm from or are not a complete product of the society I'm from? Well, I don't know, something to think about. So founders of religions have this certain thing about them that we call charisma. They inspire folks to take up a new religion and they criticize and overturn the status quo in which they live. Think about Christ knocking over all of the uh, all of the money changers in the temples. Think about Christ saying, "Nope, you're not going to do kosher law anymore." So there's there's not only inspiring people to believe something new, but to turn away from something else. The Buddha, when he said, "This is the way," um, this is these are the four noble truths. This is how you get out of suffering. He's basically saying the exact opposite of what every social group had told him to do. Remember, his father created a whole palace so he would never see a sick person or an old person or a dead person. And he just cast all that aside and posited something completely new and something different. So um, what is charisma? As I said here, charisma is what pulls people to the founders and makes them listen. Um, it's not that there's like eight or 10 religious founders of this world. There's tens and tens of thousands. So don't get wrapped up in there only being Jesus, Muhammad, and the Buddha. I mean, you, you get these charismatic figures all the time. So charisma among religious fathers can be summed up in this quote by Max Weber, who is very much the, the father of sociology. A certain quality of an individual's personality, by virtue of which he is set apart from ordinary men and treated as endowed with supernatural, superhuman, or at least specifically exceptional powers or qualities. Now, you can have a sort of sacred charisma and a secular charisma. So the difference between the Dalai Lama and the difference between, uh, and, and Ryan Gosling, they both got something. They got the it thing, they got the wow factor. But one uses those to be a religious representative and one uses those to be a cultural representative, sure. I just like having a picture of uh, Ryan Gosling and the Dalai Lama in my lecture. <clears throat> so Kreipel has this kind of odd set of arguments about charisma being radioactive. It radiates, it gives off a glow. The person that you meet who has this charisma, that's something, give off a light about them, something palpable, like this radioactive man on the left. And Kreipel actually does a really interesting a uh, bit of work in one of his uh, other studies called Mutants and Mystics, and that's where he studies the sort of mythological logic in superhero stories and comic books. It's a fantastic novel, Mutants and Mystics. So he's going to riff on this radioactive thing a bit. So the charismatic figure gives off energy, gives off vibes. I'm still unclear on what energy vi <laughs> vibes are, but everybody tells me about them. Um, okay, so but charisma also requires a sort of social context. The guru needs the disciple and the disciple needs the guru and the social setting of them being set up in the guru hall with the other devotees around, all of those are needed to be there in order for the devotee to have that experience of the charisma. So it's like if you have a battery and a light bulb and you have the positive and negative. If you lose one of the positive wires or the negative wire, the circuit's broken and it doesn't work. You need the full circuit for charisma to operate and for the guru to really exist and operate. The electric current can only flow between the charismatic guru and the disciples when the circuit is there. If either side of the context is removed, the energy ends. It must flow in order for it to, to be at all. You know, the question there for me is always, is the guru uh, absolutely needed? So, um, is the guru the source of the experience of the person who, who is their disciple? 
or does the guru catalyze an individual or group experience? Are they the source or are they the thing that sets off the thing to happen? So we've got Muktananda here again, because he was very much, you know, you can look at him in two ways. Is he the source? Did he cause the Shakti Pat to happen? Did he cause people to have these realizations? Or is it that he enabled those realizations that were going to happen anyway to get going? He just removed the barriers for the realization to happening. So did he point and cause the Kundalini to rise? Or did he point and remove the, uh, remove the blockages so the Kundalini could naturally rise? Or was just his very presence enough to inspire people to raise their own Kundalini? And I like this little quote by Baba Muktananda, which could have been said exactly by Baba Free John. Change your vision. Go deeper and deeper into meditation to where the state of extraordinary ecstasy awaits you. When you reach that state, you will become that. You will know, I am that. And he would often say that this was the, uh, a brilliant blue pearl in the heart that was the essence of consciousness. So um, the thing is, I don't want you to get too wrapped up. Uh, hold on, I have another point to make. So even if a guru is disgraced, or if that guru fails, or if that dies, the devotion of the devotees, their experiences, and their piety is real. So if a guru is found to be completely corrupt and have made up everything he said and not be living how he's living, the experiences of the people are still real. So Osho Rajneesh could be shown to really not have a lot of spiritual revelation, but his disciples still have those experiences. They are real. So, you know, I'll question a guru's piety, but I'll never question the piety and the reverence of a devotee. I think that's an important point. So don't get too wrapped up in gurus who found new religious movements. Uh, many charismatic folks do not establish new religions, but pull people into greater engagement with their own religion. So let's think of a few figures here. Um, we have like Martin Luther King had that thing. He had that thing that drew people toward him uh, and was able to cause great changes. We have Billy Graham on the right, who's a very charismatic evangelical um, throughout his life. In fact, my parents, when they became born again Christians, it was after attending a Billy Graham prayer rally in the 70s. Or what about our Greta Thunberg that we have right now, who just has something about her that's allowing her to get her message across. So charisma can be all over the place. Um, like I said, gurus can fail, but the piety of their devotees remain. So let's think about some examples here. You have John Paul II was a perfect charismatic teacher who was also an Orthodox Catholic, you know, Catholic priest. Then you have people like the Sufi saints that you see all over India and how they are Sufis, they are Muslims, but their pious power and their charisma or what they call their Barak or their Baraka, their, um, their mystic visions and abilities inspire people to be better Muslims. Or kind of one of my favorite groups are them snake handling Christians of the United States, in which these are just folks that have that, you know, between the music and the potent preaching and the grabbing of snakes that sometimes bite them and often don't, that brings people within the established religious community and brings them to a, a higher level of engagement. Okay, so what do we do with charisma? What comes next when somebody dies? How do you get from Jesus to the Vatican? So after the founder dies, the community must go on. The community becomes a tradition from the Latin word tradere, uh, which means transmit. And maybe, maybe with enough institutionalization, it can become a new religion. Now remember, tradition only needs to be handed down once. So once somebody says, this is tradition, I'm handing it down to you, you know, oh, clearly that's the way we've always done things. So when somebody says something is tradition, just remember, that only means it was handed down for sure once. So all my father has to do is, uh, you know, start eating with a fork instead of a knife or a fork instead of a spoon when he eats his pudding and say it's tradition in our family. And uh, once I do that too, hand it down once, it's tradition in our family. Okay, so there's a couple of ways. In fact, there are six ways in which tradition might become institutionalized and might institutionalize charisma. So the founder's charisma, the original charisma of the founder, must be somehow established in the world. <laughs> so the religion has to be more than just about the founder's message, but it has to be about 
live religious communities and institutions around that religion. So one might be a dreamer of vision. Somebody might have a dream or a vision to establish himself or herself or another person as a spiritual authority to gain that same charisma as the founder or the guru. Now an elder might come in and interpret this sign, uh, such as a shaman who interprets someone's dream to figure out who the next shaman is. Or on the left, we have a young Tibetan, what protection you got uh, a young Tibetan might have the vision of a past life and think that he is, or just have some sort of odd visions and odd memories. Then there'll be a committee of Tibetan Buddhist monks and officials. They come and investigate the child, see if they recognize their, or their former items or can reproduce former teaching and former knowledge to establish if that young child is a high Lama or a religious figure who's been reborn. So some of these in lineages in Tibetan Buddhism can be like 10, 20 people back, 20 lives all linked together, thought to be the same person and thus able to inherit wealth right down the line. What are other ways? Well, you can have, um, you can have a priest, you can have an office or religious role. In this sense, charisma is passed on to priests, clerics, or even families of the founders. We see this in, with, uh, with Indian Muslim saints, that their family members will then in the next and the oncoming generations become religious figures due to their connection to that saint and that saintly family. In this way, priests and clerics preserve the order and do the work of the order. They preserve the original power of the founder, but they are not charismatic themselves in the same way. Their energy, comes from being in the lineage, the parampara in sandwich, or in sandwich in Sanskrit, this, then that, then that, then that. So think about apostolic succession. So St. Peter was the first Pope, and then he touches the next guy, and he becomes the next Pope, and then the next Pope, and the next Pope. And the idea is the hand of Peter has touched each of the subsequent, each of the consequent Popes, and we have apostolic succession. So the priest is in the, or the Pope is in the exact lineage of St. Peter. Um, monastic communities do this in another interesting way and they establish the role of a monk. So think in Buddhism and Jainism, you have Buddhist and Jain monks that try to emulate the role of the Buddha or Mahavir in the founder's lifetimes. Charisma can also be put into scriptures, texts, and commentaries. So the founder's power goes into the text. So traditionally, Jewish religion was focused around the temple, but after their two temples were destroyed, the Jews created a non-temple-based Judaism known as rabbinic Buddhism, in which, and which rabbinic Judaism, and that Judaism is found in texts and is interpreted by rabbis. Think about uh, in Buddhism, you have the three jewels, the Buddha, the founder, the Dharma, his teachings, and the Sangha, the religious community. As I said, it'd be the three jewels of Buddhism. Christians refer to the living word of Christ in that you can still read the words of Christ in the, gosp in the Gospels and have a inspired vision of Christ or hear Christ speak through that. My personal favorite would have to be in Sikhism. You have a line of 10 gurus, um, one after the other after the other. And then the 10th guru said, there will be no more gurus. The spirit of Wahe Guru, the, the, the great spirit that has entered me that I am identical with in many ways, a great God is now found in our scriptures. What about uh, religious law? ethics or regulated lifestyle. So the founder and his revelations are codified into legalistic systems to make sense of the world and establish a religious community. Now we have an example here of Sharia law in Islam. Now, um, Muhammad drew extensively from Jewish and Bedouin cultures of, of, of law, and then he had his own pronouncements and interpretations on that. And then after he died for about 200 years, there were various legal schools trying to figure out how to get Sharia law. So it wasn't just established by Muhammad. There's some discourse, there's some change to it. And now there's about four major religious legal schools that make up Sharia law, which is very much a law in conversation. It's not set in stone. It's up for a lot of interpretation, unlike rabbinic law, um, as opposed to how it's depicted, how Sharia law is depicted in um, contemporary American culture. I don't think I even really need to go into that. All right, so um, yes. 
So in the Vinaya, uh, this is Buddhism in Vinaya, Vinaya are the monastic regulations. In this, they developed the way to be a monk over a long period of time after the Buddha died. So these codes and practices actually enshrine the uh, ideals of the Buddha. Okay, sacred art, architecture, and relics or material culture. When I say material culture, I mean the culture of stuff. So most religious folks now, over time have been literate and mass publication is pretty recent mass publication of literature. Folks encounter religion through material culture by the cultural stuff around us in art, in religious architecture, and in sacred objects, whether they be very expensive or very cheap. What is a relic? Now, a relic is a part of the body of holy people. Uh, so in fact, here at St. Peter's Cathedral, there are at least 100 past popes and priests that are interred in the area. Their very bones and flesh interned there make that religion more valuable and more powerful and more present. Uh, yes. So the interesting thing I think about architecture is that it always persists. We see old architecture from before our time. And these are permanent structures from the past. So architecture communicates with us. But if architecture isn't enshrined or made holy in some way, it'll just be bulldozed down and replaced by progress. So with some examples of sacred architecture that, and material stuff and sacred art, in the center here is a darga. So that's a shrine to a Sufi saint, a Sufi Muslim saint who has died and people go there to still partake in their communication and, and relationship with that saint. So their bodies are in there. To the left is a stupa. Now these are made by Buddhists. They were originally to entomb monks or, and the original ones were all said to have a relic, a full part of the Buddha's body within them. Uh, you, they're, they're lovely. I was just visiting some in Colorado recently. And uh, you can find them all over the world. And then on the right, I have an amulet market. So in this, the amulets in Thai Buddhism will be associated often with um, sort of sacred monks, realized monks, and parts of the monks' bodies even, or things the monks have touched, or holy things the monks will be pressed into these amulets that you'll see uh, Thai Buddhists wearing all the time. I often joke that, um, you know, a Thai Buddhist, you can tell the difference between a Thai Buddhist by his big amulet and then the Thai Buddhist monk who's not talking about amulets. But in reality, that monk is probably going to have an amulet that was made by another monk. Okay, so we're closing down the last part of this lecture. I want to talk about three categories, church, sect, and mysticism. These are ideal categories that we're going to use to kind of think about. They are, don't really perfectly correspond to uh, actual social institutions, but by looking at these three categories, we can get a better judgment on how uh, religions operate in society. So this threefold system was set up by Ernst Trolsch, who was a Protestant historian living from 1865 to 1923, and he wrote this classic study of the sociology of religion called The Social Teachings of the Christian Church, published in 1912. So, um, like I said, church sect and mysticism are three ideal types of social patterns, none of which are perfectly found in the actual world. These are abstractions. We're, we're making categories in order to think with. Don't try to get these to compare perfectly to ideals. Don't try to compare these ideals to your experience. For instance, we're going to talk about the definition of church, and it's not going to be like your church, the individual church body. Um, it's talking about the church in a greater stance, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So look to ways in which your church might represent aspects of the church, of sects, and of mysticism. So one caveat here is religious belief, I maintain, and I think this is absolutely true, is not about conscious choice, but is dictated by the society you are born into. While we have rituals of, say, confirmation or profession of faith that talk about how you have made this choice uh, out of your own free will to become a part of this religious group, in reality, there's not much of a choice. You do what your family does. You do what your church does. The notion of even choosing your religion is a modern one. I asked my folks when I was a little kid, I said, how did we decide to be Christians? And they said, well, we looked at a whole bunch of other religions and we didn't, we didn't like them, so we decided to be Christians. I was like, like what? And they said, well, in Hinduism, you could be reborn as a worm, so we didn't want to believe in that. And this made sense to me at the age of like four. It's troubling to me now. Anyway, so uh, even in our current lives, the majority of people just practice the religion of their family. We join the religion of our society. In fact, our social context, not 
our choice dictates our religious ideas. Furthermore, there's a lot of accusations about hypocrisy in our culture. We think hypocrisy is so darn bad. I think hypocrisy is standard in all religious groups um, and all societies. Many folks argue that observed practices and ideas are not found in scriptures, so that must be hypocrisy. Well, no. In fact, scripture is always interpreted to justify practices, not to generate practices. So is it hypocritical for someone to pray to angels, even when people aren't praying angels in the Bible? I don't know. Original sin isn't in the, isn't in the Bible. Is it hypocritical to believe in that? Um, yeah. It, it, what, is it hypocritical for Protestant Christians to be anti-abortion and pro-death penalty? Is it hypocritical? Or... Is it always that we're trying to figure out what we believe, what our politics are, what we want to advance in the world, and find ways to use scriptures to justify those things, which I would argue is the essence of religious thinking, using religious authority to justify kind of what you are already going to do. All right, so what is a church? So a church is a religious organization closely aligned with the political polity, the political bodies, the political body of the elites which seeks to instill a comprehensive and singular worldview in which people participate more or less automatically. Here you should think about the medieval Catholic church. And we have a great quote by this, <laughs> by Stephen Bruce, the uh, historian of Catholicism. And this is what you know, we mean by the church, what Trolls meant, the church. A small number of highly trained officials acting on behalf of the state and the people who glorify God. So it's a small number of highly trained individuals who glorify God acting on behalf of the state and the people. That sentence bothers me. They did so with a liturgy and with music that was far too complex for the active participation of lay people. Religion was done not in the local language, but in Latin, which united religious professionals across Christendom, but separated them from the laity, the common people. There were no hymns and only sometimes a sermon. Until the late 14th century, later in many places, there were no seats in the part of the church used by the audience. They either stood or knelt in an unheated building. Ordinary people were expected to behave morally, to attend church on the great feast days, and to finance the professionals who did the serious religious work on behalf of the community and the nation. In this sense, the priests do religious work, the laity just kind of do their thing and the rituals of the priests will secure them salvation. And the priests and the church will be aligned with ruling powers in order to um, maintain their own sort of strong position in society. The ideas that they set forth are thought to be universally true and any challenge of them are thought to be universally false. So um, the church aligns with the political institutions of elites toning down other worldly concerns to compromise with the social world. This installs a sort of normative worldview of the truth, and salvation occurs through objective mechanisms and rituals of the church. No matter how much a Protestant claims to have free will and choose to ask Christ into his or her chart, into her heart, the church still supports that ruling local structure. The Catholic Church had a long run as the church, the big church, for hundreds and hundreds of years. But the Protestant church was never so unified or universally powerful. An argument could be made for a general Christi Christianity in the United States that is like the church, but it's not as coherently organized to be the church. There is a general evangelical vibe that influenced the political world and that aligns with the political world, often against scriptural injunctions. We observe this, but it's not well organized into a united front. It's almost as if there are tons of Protestant groups that are all vying for the connections to political powers. Now, Kreppel makes this argument that the church is intolerant for it sets out the truth and there is no truth outside of the church. But religious tolerance is like, a, it's a new idea. It's not something that we had before. It's a modern idea and Kreifel uses it to judge other religious groups. I'm not sure if it's fair. I mean, how is it fair to judge groups in this way considering the idea of tolerance is inconsistent with their beliefs? If you believe there is truth, there is, there is one God, his son came down as Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died, got rid of your sins, saved you, and that's the truth. You gotta go out and tell everybody else that's believing the not truth that they are full of crap. 
That's part of it. If you believe there is an essential truth that gives salvation, then you are necessarily intolerant. So looking at different religious groups and judging them by their level of tolerance, I think is inconsistent with the project of religion and what it means to know something in religion. And, you know, from the Protestant background, I have what it means to love people. If I love people, I must deliver them from the tortures of hell. That's the way it is. If you believe that system, you must be intolerant, unless you're theologically more sophisticated and you can think your way into a better way to express those ideas. So what is a sect? Now, a sect is a voluntary religious organization that people choose to join. A group splits from the mainstream or social world or a larger public church body. They leave these larger groups due to some disagreement with the church or due to a new religious leader, maybe a charismatic religious leader. They are always related to the church because they split from it. They define themselves as being separated from that church. So you have the larger church in which it, you have a split off that becomes a sect. If that sect becomes sort of less odious, they can be turned into a denomination of the church. If they get so far out that uh, they're not connected to the church in any way, they're called a cult or a new religious movement. The point is, is they are a protest. They are dividing from the church and going toward a state of unequilibrium. So these sect members usually describe a more powerful religious experience that they've had as a part of being a part of the sect. They are born again. The life in the sect is generally more rigorous and engaged than the lives of those in the church. These sects also do not have the same sense of clergy and are not connected to the priestlyhood in the same way that other church groups are. These sects can become established religions in and of themselves, but often they are reincorporated into the church. Many monastic orders were sects that broke off of Catholicism, like the Jesuits or the Franciscans, but now they're considered a, more like a denomination of the Catholic church. Or you have the, the sect groups or the splinter groups in Protestant Christianity that then get turned into sort of flavors of Protestant Christianity, such as uh, the Reformed Church of America, which are the Dutch Calvinists, which I belong to, as opposed to the Christian Reformed Church, which is the rival group that I believe almost the exact same thing, but they don't get along. But they all live in Michigan anyway, such as life. People don't get along in Michigan. Anyway, so the sects are generally tolerant of other groups who are sects like them, but they're not tolerant of other religions, and they ask the church to tolerate them, but like I said, they're not tolerant of other religious groups. Think also about the Mormons. That's definitely a sect that came out of Christianity, established by Joseph Smith, and then wandered its way into being almost its own uh, religion that, depending on who you talk to, is Christianity or isn't Christianity. All right, so mysticism. Mysticism is a highly individualistic type of religious orientation which focuses on the direct experience of inner spiritual realities and hence is very difficult to organize socially. So don't think of this as just like American individualism. I mean, you want to think, ah, we're all mystics. Oh, we're all mystics because we decide on our own to be Christians. But mysticism requires sustained engagement with religious doctrine and direct experience of religious truth. So when Trolsch is setting this out, he's talking about it, about mysticism as a sociological context. It's about, and it's about looking, I don't even want to say that anymore. So I previously de described mysticism as the individual having a direct experience of the divine, tuning into the inner experiences and individual interpretation of revelation. It becomes almost a self-revelation. You turn to the swirling lights and channels and whatnot in the body and then have experiences of God and then you know truth that you've immediately encountered. So um, the mystic urges, the mystic sees the work of the church and the sects to be not enough. Real salvation comes only through personal experience of truth and the divine. Trulsch argued that mysticism is the mode of religion only of the educated, the elite who are able to work through the experiences of the divine and having access to full religious doctrine. He sort of argues that the perennial truth of religion is found by personal experience. He says that sort of all religious practices, once one sees the mystical thing, and all of doctrines appear to be the path of the divine. 
And this mysticism is tolerant. It justifies any religious vision and practice that leads one toward an experience of the divine. While, as Trulls argues, this is the most true form, and Kripal agrees with him, it's the most true form of religion, whatever that means, it's never well organized. So uh, the most true form of religion is the one that cannot be made into an institution, but institutionalized religion is the most basic form of religion, and is the one that is most likely to lead toward violence and intolerance. S to some degree, Trulls' idea of religion and mystical religion is like, as we have in the modern world, being spiritual but not religious. Trolls argued that there could be a spiritual religion that is not connected to the church and could appeal to the masses. And like I said, maybe we're seeing this now in a spiritual but not religious attitude amongst, amongst many young people today. Uh, he even argues at the end of his book, Trolls does, that the religious institutions of the, uh, his book is about the religious institutions of the church, but he ends by saying the kingdom of God is in us and that the true religion is mystical and is outside of the church and outside of the sect. So what are our takeaways on all of this? Well, one, charismatic, finger, charismatic figures continually rise and found new religious movements. To the extent that that charismatic figure's vision is spread and their charisma becomes institutionalized, they can form new religions, in fact. We can also think about the church, sect, and mysticism as modes of religion, and we can look at those distinctions to try to understand how religious groups interact and how they identify themselves and how those groups really work. These modes help us understand the development of social institutions and religion. And finally, the groups that we are born into end up being our religious truths. Our truths are dictated by these social groups. So whenever you're thinking that you really know something to be spiritually true, Ask yourself, why would a social group want that? Why would the members of my church want that? Why would that appeal to someone? How could there be material or social reasons for specific religious understandings? To give you the classic example, Max Weber wrote a book called um, The Rise of the Protestant Ethic and the Rise of Capitalism, in which he demonstrates that the way that Catholics work, socialize, understand the nation of, nature of the soul is not suited to capitalism. You should want people to want to strive, to work hard, to save their money, to not circulate too much, to work toward an end, to make a free choice toward that. That's a person that will work long hours, whereas a Catholic's gonna be more likely to uh, knock off early and go hang around, he argues. Uh, that's, that's not a really good depiction of that classic book, but hey, I was pulling it off the fly. All right, you have a good one out there. I will see you next time.